Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Um, James back here from Canadian Wildlife Federation. We've got, uh, I think some people are still joining as we go, but we'll, we'll jump into this to, uh, to get this started. Uh, so welcome to our first um, webinar of a series of three we're looking to hold uh, about creating pollinator habitat. Um, and uh, specifically on looking at rights of ways and, uh, and um, corridors for pollinators. Um, I should mention right off the bat maybe that if, if anybody, or if we don't have the chat uh, function enabled, but if anybody has a question or difficulties hearing or something like that, you can um, type that into the Q&A. If you go to scroll down to the bottom of your screen, it should be on the left side there, I think. Um, so you can type that in and I'll see it and we I'll be moderating uh, questions um, for the end. We'll, we'll answer questions at the end, but also I'll, I'll keep an eye on that if there's any Thing that comes up as we're hearing. If you need somebody to speak up louder or uh, not seeing something, then uh, you can get in touch with us that way. Um, so um, we will be using the Q&A. So as I said, we'll answer questions at the end. But as we're going through, if anything comes up, you can always type your questions in as we go. And uh, I'll filter through them as we go and I'll compile some of the more common questions all together. And, um, and we'll answer them at the end, but you can definitely write them in as we go. We'll start off with a little bit about Canadian Wildlife Federation. Um, so CWF, we have uh, a number of programs. I'm just going to go with a real quick outline of who we are, what we do. Uh, we're a national um, conservation uh, NGO, uh, registered charity. We um, have a few um, core areas that we work on. Um, as you see up here, there's lakes and rivers, endangered species, biodiversity, fields and forests, coasts and oceans. We have education and connection with nature. Uh, a few of the projects we work on as well. Um, I should mention we also have a uh, network of supporters of over 350,000 uh, individuals across the country. Um, so a large network of, of people that we can reach and speak with on a regular basis. Um, and specific uh, projects we're up to. Um, we have a number, um, but uh, a quick overview of our conservation activities. Um, we're working on um, the mortality of right whales uh, in Atlantic Canada to reduce this impact. Um, there's been a lot of, uh, that's been in the news a lot in the last couple of years. We're working to restore um, fish habitat through uh, stream berry removal, mostly in British Columbia, but then looking elsewhere as well. We have recovery act activities on um, endangered and at risk bats, um, the impacts of exclusion from homes and bat box installations. We're also working to um, recover endangered freshwater turtles uh, on specifically looking at roadside or roadway mortality and uh, American eel, the impacts of, of hydro dams and, and freshwater systems. Uh, we're also engaging the public in conservation through citizen science projects uh, using iNaturalist.ca, which is a wildlife reporting system to um, log uh, anything you see out in nature and it adds it to a database. We're up over uh, 2 million observations now throughout the country. Um, and a way to do that as well is through BioBlitzes to get people out to um, partake in a uh, participatory, participatory activity to record as many wildlife species as we can find in a given area in a set period of time, which is usually about 24 hours. Um, we also are engaging um, directly the youth um, in conservation and, and meaningful actions through our conservation core uh, and wild outside programs to get uh, youth directly involved and uh, working in the conservation field. So speaking of our pollinator um, webinar that we have today, we have two presenters. We have Carolyn Callahan here uh, at Canadian Wildlife Federation, who's our senior conservation biologist on the terrestrial side of things. Um, she's interested in understanding the factors that put species at risk and determining how to reduce that impact um, of the factors to recover these species. Um, she and her team look for uh, compatibility with farming practices, uh, business practices on roadways and rights of way with the recovery of species at risk. Um, they, her team studies a variety of uh, species under the Canadian Species at Risk Act, including Western chorus frog, monarch butterfly, who we'll hear, I will hear a lot about today, uh, grassland bird species such as bobolink and eastern meadowlark, and also declining pollinator species. 
um, partners in our conservation work include uh, agricultural producers, uh, producer organizations, Hydro One, Lanark County, and the National Capital Commission. Caroline's optimistic about recovering pollinator species through habitat restoration on rights of way. And she's gonna to talk to us about setting the stage of why, why this work is important. Um, Holly Bickerton is a botanist and ecologist based here in Ottawa, uh, Ontario, which is where CWF is also located. Um, for the past 18 years, she has worked for government agencies and uh, as a consulting ecologist in Southern Ontario and in Australia. Holly specializes in species at risk inventory uh, and managing, management, species recovery, ecological assessment, monitoring and management uh, planning. And since two, uh, 2017, Holly has worked with us here at CWF providing technical advice on meadow and prairie habitat restoration. So Holly is going to talk to us more about the what and how uh, logistics of, of how this happens. And I will turn it over to Carolyn to start. Introduction and welcome everyone to our first webinar on pollinator habitat restoration on my TV. So you're unmuted now. So you were muted before. Okay. Okay, thank you, James, for the introduction and welcome everyone to our webinar. So I wanna begin with uh, the inspiration for why we're doing this work and to present our vision for uh, pollinator conservation. So to begin with, the monarch butterfly is, has been declining quite steeply over the last 20 years. They've uh, declined by over 80%. So that's very concerning. And this graph that you're seeing shows the area of land that they occupy in their wintering range each winter. So rather than count each butterfly, they count the area that the butterflies occupy. And uh, two years ago, we were down to 2.48 hectares. Now, last year, we were up to six hectares. So there's an uptick in the population. We're optimistic, but we still have a very long way to go for the monarch. And monarchs need migratory pathways. So they migrate all the way to uh, central Mexico to their wintering grounds. And this is the Eastern population of the monarch butterfly. And then after the winter is over, they take several generations to migrate all the way back up again. And some of them end up in, in Canada uh, and they exist across much of Southern Canada, but they part of their life cycle, they migrate. So they need uh, migratory corridors. We've received a lot of news, probably many of you are aware that insects are declining throughout the world and it's very concerning. Some studies that have had very long term studies of 40 years or more showing 70% decline of insect species. Um, it's becoming a real concern across the world uh, among, among scientists and others. Um, and among those that are declining are pollinators and we have hundreds, thousands of species of pollinators that are declining. And it's very important that uh, we maintain wild species of pollinators on our landscapes. Why? Because they provide important services. Um, everyone kind of knows that they pollinate crops, and particularly our fruits and vegetables, all of the yummy things we like to eat, nut fruits, even coffee, they pollinate. And the value of that globally is over $200 billion per year in services. If we're one word to value those services. Um, the other thing that we don't think about so much though is that pollinators pollinate most of our wildflowers in, around the world. About 87.5% of wildflowers globally are pollinated by insects. Uh, without them, our ecosystems would be changed radically. So, you know, we have very, a lot of reason, both economically and others, to be concerned about the decline of pollinator. So um, we're going to talk about the insect decline. If you look at this figure, the very middle part, the bullseye is insect decline. The next concentric circle is what are the drivers of the decline? Why are they declining? We look on the upper left, increasing habitat isolation, the habitat's becoming more fragmented. Quality of habitat is decreasing. Climate change is occurring. And some insects are very particular about their temperature needs. And then the last one is habitat loss. So all of those are drivers of change 
and we need to take action to uh, mitigate those drivers in every way. And to me, this is very, um, very interesting because what we'll talk about today is addressing three of those four, everything but climate change will be addressed through our talk today and the actions that we're taking. We can do this in a, a bunch of different ways. One of the ways that we feel is really important is rights of way. Those are linear features such as roadsides, power corridors, hydro corridors, solar and wind farms, pipelines, railway lines, recreational pathways. They all have some sort of vegetation either on them or alongside them. And they occur at scale that species like monarch need us to, to be looking at scale for recovery. And if the vegetation is managed appropriately, we can really make a difference to habitat uh, availability and migratory corridors as we've talked about. And so this restoration would occur in the form of wildflower meadow habitat. Uh, species like the monarch, they're, they're generalists when they're adults. So they can nectar, they have a source of many different plants, the flowers that they can use as a nectaring source, but they have very few host plants. And that's the milkweed. There's a bunch of different species, about 15 species across Canada of the milkweed, but they're very special, specialized on them when they're in their caterpillar stage. You can see that on the left-hand side. So monarch need both uh, host plants, the milkweed, and nectaring plants um, in order to uh, help to recover them. So here's, our, here's a bit of a visual of our vision. We envision that together with provinces, with municipalities, the federal government, over time, we could recover pathways for pollinators all across Canada, on our roadways, on all of our rights of, long, of way, uh, in a manner that is appropriate for uh, the, what we need to do to address the problem. So we envision that that could be laid out and we do, can do that in, in partnership. Benefits of restoring these rights of way. If you look at this as a beautiful diagram on the right hand side that shows kind of a profile of plants, of flowers and grass, native grasses, and at the above the soil line and below the soil lines. So you can see all those beautiful roots, they're very deep rooted. And uh, that's quite powerful because they have a bunch of functions because they're so deep rooted. Um, in fact, they're, they're helpful for mitigating against drought and against flooding. They keep the soil in the ground. They prevent washing away. They can trap um, pesticides, herbicides, nutrients, et cetera. So they provide a bunch of functions that are helpful to us. They require, these plants require very little maintenance and no soil amendments. So they actually thrive on poor soil conditions. Um, and because they're so deep rooted, they actually sequester carbon. So they're powerful units of carbon storage, and that's one of the tools that we need in our toolkit for mitigating against climate change. Uh, when you do restore um, to a meadow habitat, uh, wild pollinator species such as bees and flies, butterflies, moths, beetles increase. So increase in both abundance and diversity. Okay, so that kind of gives you a picture of uh, why, why we're interested in doing this kind of work. And I'm going to now turn things over to Holly. And she, uh, oh, right. Thank you. We have one more thing to talk about. So right up front, I just want to say, and this is an important, we need to have certain tools for restoring um, rights of way habitat. And one of our important tools is herbicides. So uh, here on the upper left shows someone with a backpack and a wand and they're targeting particular alien invasive species to reduce, to reduce them, knock them back, which would then allow these native uh, meadow species to come up. Um, uh, ATV use as well. Uh, currently on roadsides, we see a lot of boom spraying um, and that is very broad scale application. And that is not so conducive to pollinator habitat because it knocks everything back. So used appropriately as a good tool, it's, uh, it's an important thing that we would want to keep in our toolbox for restoration. Uh, so now I'm gonna turn things over to Holly and she'll talk more specifically about what we're doing and how we're going to do it. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, 
I just want to draw your attention to a bunch of different approaches that right of way organizations can take. And I've structured this a bit like an apple tree because it's, you know, it, there, we've got low hanging fruit and we've got some more involved approaches that people may be interested in taking. So I'm going to start at the bottom, actually. Uh, a number of right of way organizations have been really successful with demonstration plantings and with that communication. So this is helpful to raise public awareness in highly visible locations. Often these are turning locations, visible portions of roadsides, welcome centers, head offices. And this really does help, not just in showing the commitment and leadership, but also in explaining to the public why these changes are, are occurring on your, on your rights of way and why they're needed. Um, a, a second approach that is more involved and certainly more involved in terms of internal communication is changing the management practices on the rights of way themselves. So uh, first and foremost, reducing mowing because that leaves us with no nectar resources or pollen resources for pollinators. Uh, there are also options to change timing and I'm gonna share a bit more information on that at the end. And of course, reducing spraying, particularly broadcast spraying and moving to techniques of integrated vegetation management. And that's uh, short form is IVM. So that'll come up a couple more times as well. Uh, also, a, a relatively cost-effective approach is just replacing seed mixes in bare ground following restoration, following construction, when you have a weed-free seed bed, and commit to using native seeds in that seed mix rather than the traditional turf grasses or um, other types of non-native species. Uh, and finally, probably one of the most intensive approaches uh, is converting existing rights of way. Most of these are dominated by pretty aggressive non-native species in many cases. Uh, and so they do require some treatment in order to prepare the seed bed and then seeding those. So that again is the most intensive, but that was the, that was the nature of our experiment. And so I'll share some of our lessons learned with you. I have a few examples from different sectors, and these are all US examples. We do have some Canadian examples, and we're hoping to share some of those with you in later webinars. Um, but from the states, the Ohio Department of Transportation manages the state highways, so interstates uh, and other smaller roadsides. Uh, they've been really helpful to us. They have a lot of expertise now. In 2018, they implemented a mowing reduction plan. So on some areas of roadside, this meant changing from up to 10 times mowing per year to only once every one to three years. And that was just depending on the site, the level of woody encroachment. And by the end of 2019, they had virtually instantly created or naturalized 80,000 acres of habitat. Uh, and you can see on the left slide there, you can see the milkweed and other um, herbaceous plants really starting to uh, return to that area. And the interesting lesson was that as a result of this, in the first year, the savings tallied $2.2 million US. That was actually expected to increase year over year. And the reason is that they have multi-year uh, management contracts. And so as those management contracts expire, their savings were likely to, to increase. And so the direct, with that directed savings, they could now free up uh, budget in order to direct that to integrated vegetation management approaches. So directing, um, directing spraying, directing mowing, directing a variety of techniques only to the areas where it's needed. And with that, Ohio was really successful in doing a lot of internal and external communications. So you can see on the left, they've got a nice, dem or sorry, on the right, a nice demonstration plot with signage and a highly visible area. They've got lots of communication products, including uh, just these nice little branded seed packets that are at the far, the far bottom there. Um, over to the utility sector, the New York Power Authority uh, in about 2008, uh, maybe earlier actually, initiated an integrated vegetation management approach. This is a four-year cycle, so really reducing mowing, really reducing spraying across its network. So this is the main utility rural areas of New York State. Uh, and you can see a picture of their management plan there on the cycle and, and the different areas of that 
line and what's intended to be done in each area in each year. And as a result, they've seen substantial reduction in herbicide use across their line, and they've promoted exactly what they want under, under lines, which is open, low-growing vegetation. Uh, and it happens to be extremely uh, friendly to pollinators and other wildlife while not threatening the lines. And this is a really in innovative and interesting uh, organization. Fresh Energy is based in Minnesota. Uh, they promote the establishment of pollinator habitat on solar installations. So instead of spreading pea gravel or turf grass or you know, whatever kind of low maintenance uh, substrate underneath solar panels, uh, they promote low growing vegetation, low growing native vegetation, so specific mixes uh, underneath solar panels. So in this way, they've restored, uh, well, this is an old figure, but at least 2,000 acres of pollinator habitat, and a couple years ago had projects in 10 states. So knowing all of this, uh, at CWF, we were very interested in initiating a project of our own. Uh, using our own conditions and our own area. So um, we, we approached and were approached by a number of great partners. Uh, we were, uh, we've had uh, a, a pilot project over the last year uh, and our partners are at the bottom. This was actually our, our beautiful sign that was created by CWF staff. Uh, at the bottom, uh, Hydro One, we've been restoring habitats along uh, I'll show you the sites in a minute. This is our main utility in Ontario for those who might be calling in from elsewhere. The National Capital Commission, this is the main federal landowner in Ottawa and Gatineau. And Lanark County, uh, so this is a small, well, rural municipality, not that small, big in area, big in road size, uh, to the west of Ottawa. And our funder was the, the Ontario Trillium Foundation. So our aim was to test habitat restoration methods on, on rights of way. Uh, we took a very experimental approach, and I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, we were trying to determine different approaches to site preparation. We were also aiming to determine whether native plants could compete with invasive wild parsnip. So just a brief introduction for those who aren't familiar with wild parsnip. It's on the left there. It's uh, that yellow flower. It's related to Queen Anne's lace. Um, and across eastern Ontario, many of our roadsides have become dominated and parklands and, you know, just areas of disturbed habitat where mowing has occurred uh, by this invasive species, which can cause burns if you get the sap on your skin. So it's perceived as a, as a health risk. And that has led to a response across eastern Ontario that you'll see on the right. Um, these are pictures from roadsides this past summer. Uh, so many of our roadsides in this part of Ontario are broadcast sprayed. You can see the burned off grass there and then mowed. And the, the challenge with this is that the spraying is often with selective herbicides, which are broad, uh, broadleaf directed. So they're directed at taking out wild parsnip, which is a broadleaf plant. But in the meantime, all of our nectar and many of our pollen plants are also are also um, uh, broadleaf plants. So here are our restoration sites. Uh, in the center, you can see the gray the gray on the Ottawa River. There, that's Ottawa, and Hydro One, our Hydro One site, is right in suburban Ottawa. It's a corridor through through the suburban area. Uh, the NCC site is at. Greens Creek on the Ottawa River. It's one of the parkways through, through the city. And in the west, two rural roads in Lanark on County Road 7 and County Road 6. What did these roadsides look like when we initiated the project last fall? When you look at them, you can see that they're visually dominated by grass. And when you look at the pie charts, you'll see that as a result of our monitoring, we know that the species that they're dominated by are non-native. So uh, in both cases, actually, I think it was mostly reed canary grass. <laughs> and, uh, and part of this dominance, this dominance at least is partly a result of, of the selective herbicide spraying. It's, it's probably a result of the aggression of the grasses themselves as well. But I also just want to draw your attention to the very thin slices of, of light blue pie, uh, which, is, which represents the native flowering plant. So there's really very, very few resources. This is our main target group for our native um, pollinating insects. 
Non-native flowering plants also can offer some pollen uh, and also really quite a low, low percentage of those in terms of cover. Uh, on the right, you can see there's a little bit more of the non-native flowering plants. And, and that actually represents a wild parsnip that was at the site. So it does fall into that group and does offer some resources. Uh, and it was present at that site because that was part of our, we needed to have a site where we could test. Uh, test. So what did this look like? Uh, in the fall, uh, we took a fairly, as I said, experimental approach. Uh, the standard approach is to treat, and this is an approach that's recommended by conservation groups in the US, including the Xerxes Society and so on, is to treat sites uh, with herbicides, sometimes with cropping, sometimes with both in succession. We had just one year of funding. So uh, we did, uh, at some sites we did treatment in the fall and then again in the spring. But many of our partners are interested. There's obviously people are concerned about herbicide use, wondering if it's necessary. So part of our approach was to experiment with uh, other, other methods. So at, at each county road, we had a herbicide treated site and a moan and tilled site. These are not big plots. They're, you know, 50 meters along the road, the width of a rural roadside. So uh, that gives you a bit of a visual. And then in May, 2019, we were out seeding. So up in the upper left there, there's a it was, uh, I'll just give a quick uh, nod to the challenge of finding some locally adapted native seed. Uh, this was one of the lessons for us that it was a bit of a challenge to find. Uh, we were successful in finding native seed, but we had to make a custom mix of that. Uh, and so that does require a little bit of technical uh, ability. So I'll talk a little bit more on that later. So we hand broadcasted the seeds and we, uh, this one site, <laughs> these two Lanark sites that were not too big, we were able to actually roll them in into the soil. You can do this through a variety of methods, even with, you know, clean ATV. Um, the point is to try to get good seed to soil contact so that the seeds uh, can germinate as quickly as possible and also not be lost to insect predators, birds. Uh, we also have, were fortunate to have some plugs donated to us by the Fletcher Wildlife Garden. So we, we planted those at the Lanark sites. This one is a little columbine, I think. Um, and then we walked away. And we walked away because we wanted this not to be a garden. We wanted this to be a meadow. And so we wanted to see what would be the outcome uh, in under native, under natural conditions. I think with the drought that we had in June, I think there was a, a bit of watering of the plugs that occurred, but that was, that was it. Our Hydro One site, as you can see, is much bigger. So this is between two spans, basically in a, in a suburban area. It's 1.4 hectares. The site had been cleared recently of common buckthorn, a woody shrub and over the last couple of years had regenerated. And you can see the cover in this, even visually, is quite different. Uh, it's still dominated by non-native grasses, but there's a much higher percentage of native flowering plants in this. So maybe less than a quarter, maybe a fifth. Uh, and, a, and a lot of that was your standard asters, golden rods, and so on. The site was treated. Uh, it was mown and, and graded somewhat and uh, treated with herbicide in the fall, again in the spring. And this is our team out seeding in, in, on the hydro line uh, in June in 2019. Oh, I just also want to mention we did have, uh, we, obviously we had a site, uh, an NCC site. Uh, we don't, we weren't able to do the, pre, the prior monitoring for that. So I'm only going to focus today on the land art, but hopefully we'll have some results to share in coming, coming webinars on that site. So what happened? <laughs> um, when you look on the left-hand side, that's, these are both pictures from 2019, and perhaps you're thinking, you know, it doesn't look so great. Maybe it's not quite what you expected. And I guess this is one of the first lessons of habitat restoration with native seed is that it does take time. People have said to me, time and patience are the ingredients of habitat restoration. So many of these native seeds will not even flower in their first year. They need cold stratification. 
they need to spend the winter in the soil, and we're hoping to see different and more germination in the spring. But nonetheless, when you get up close with this on your hands and knees, as, as I do, <laughs> um, on the right, you can see what's coming forward. And there were seedlings of evening primrose, asters, joe pieweed, bone set, many of the native plants that we had sown milkweed uh, and swamp milkweed. So uh, it was a very positive uh, result. You can see below the percentage cover has shifted quite dramatically to be over a third native flowering plants. And interestingly, non-native flowering plants returned as well. At a couple sites, those were some of the clovers. Um, and the non-native grasses have really been pushed back. One site was a little bit different. Uh, as you can see, it started out with a higher percentage of native flowering plants at the beginning. So we, did, we were able to shift that to some degree. Um, you can see that purple fuzzy haze that's kind of covering the site. That's a, a non-native agrostis um, that is responsible for a lot of the non-native grass cover that's represented in 2019. The good news is that a lot of the reed canary grass seems to have been diminished. Uh, so I think next year's challenge will be looking at ways, if we are able to, to pull back on, on some of that and, and really increase the competitive ability of the native flowering plants, which you can see are there. Um, also, this is partly an artifact of the fact that this is a transect. So, you know, the site is 1.4 hectares and the transect happens to be where it happens to be. So, um, so as the site as a whole is, uh, has some interesting results and I'll, I'll show you that this kind of expresses that as well. So if our measure is the success of native flowering plants uh, and the numbers of species that we have instead of the cover you can see the important lines are the horizontal dotted lines. These are the average numbers of native flowering plant species. The lower one is what was present before we restored in 2018. So the average across all sites was 4.3 species. And you can see it was really low, obviously, at certain sites, at, at, at site 60, one native flowering plant species. By 2019, the upper dotted line, we've shifted that to 9.2 species on average of native flowering plants. So pretty successful. Overall, we've increased the number, the availability of different types of species for insect pollen. We focused on plants because that's an indicator, if you like, of what pollinators are able to um, attend at the site. Uh, a bit easier to measure, but many studies out there prove that if you build, if you build it, they will come effectively. So that the native flower, the native insect diversity also increases of not just um, bees and butterflies, but other groups of insects. So uh, what can we say on a couple of our other goals, uh, but particularly about site preparation? Is there any difference between treating a site as is recommended with herbicide versus not and just mowing and tilling? Um, what we can say is that visually there's not a lot of difference yet after one season. I'm suspecting we might see that difference augment in the coming season. At the moment, it looks like the differences between the sites could be more important than the difference between methods. So we have to go into that data a little bit deeper and, and also continue to monitor that because it's an important question for us and for our partners. Also, what were our results with, native, with a, a non-native wild parsnip? Uh, to that, we can say the wild parsnip was not outcompeted by our seeding mix. I think you could expect this. These seedlings are only a couple of inches high at the moment. But what we can say is that tilling is not recommended where the weed pressure is high. Uh, the wild parsnip really exploded at that one site uh, where the site was tilled. And I think that's because the seeds present in the soil uh, came to the top and germinated. And it's going to take us more than one season to exhaust seed banks in areas where that weed pressure is high. So we'll continue to follow up. Uh, on a positive note, we've had a lot of, well, several other initiatives, particularly Lanark County. You can see Lanark County's road network there on the left. In addition to the pilot project that we've been working with them on, uh, Lanark County has reduced the mowing uh, across 562 kilometers of roadways. So 
their whole, virtually their whole network. Uh, and we did the math and we realized that fence to fence with the reduced mowing requirement that leads to partial restoration at least of over about 450 hectares. And interestingly, this is spatially distributed. So it is that corridor network that Carolyn was referring to. And um, Lanark has also experimented with using hydro seeding with native seeds. So if you're familiar with the seeding that occurs from uh, with slurries, often colored slurries of water and mulch with seeds on usually bridge abutments and slopes in order to prevent erosion following construction, that's hydro seeding. It's usually tricky with native seed because of the size of the seed. And Lanark has had some good results with it. And the picture on the right is one of their hydro seeded locations. They've also done demonstration plantings, uh, have signage on the roadsides and in other places and at public events. And for all of these efforts, they've been rewarded with a, a, a roadside management award by the North American uh, Pollinator Partnership Protection Campaign, I believe. Yeah. So we're hoping that uh, Lanark will be available to share some more of their uh, experience on a future webinar. So a quick summary from me, and then we can move into questions. So a summary of our, our lessons, and we learned a lot of lessons in this project. <laughs> um, restoration with native seeds, we have demonstrated, it increases both the cover and the diversity of the native flowering plants that many, many different pollinators need. We've learned that multi-year site preparation of the weed-free seed bed is certainly the most widely recommended approach. It will almost certainly improve our success. Uh, and for that, we just continue to seek kind of multi-year funding and, uh, and some time to experiment with that. Uh, also, post-construction soils represent a very cost-effective way to plant native seeds. So just simply by swapping out traditional seed mixes and creating a different seed schedule, this represents a, a good opportunity to get some native plants on the landscape. Another very cost-effective way seems to be reducing mowing and spraying uh, across a network that can lead to benefits that, that can then be directed elsewhere. We also learned that native seed is in short supply in some locations. Uh, we're in a more north temperate biome here in eastern Ontario. There's some seed supply and some mixes, certainly for Carolinian area, prairies, uh, I'm not too familiar with the Western Canada needs, but uh, we went to a custom mix specifically because the mixes, the standard mixes that were available did not reflect the native plants in our landscape. So we're working on that. That's definitely going to be a long-term work in progress. It takes communication and it takes time to change people's approaches and people's uh, aesthetics. So this is, we're talking about the general public in part, uh, what they expect to see on a roadside, but also internal uh, communications, uh, certainly to change operations practices, there's a big communications. But on the positive side, we have observed huge public interest in this topic, um, both with our partners, uh, you know, fantastic partners, uh, staff level, corporate level, and also tremendous volunteer potential. We've had lots and lots of interest in seed collection events that we've done. Uh, this webinar, uh, we've been really pleasantly surprised at how much I think people really want to get involved and get personally involved with this. With this. As Carolyn mentioned, it's a, it's a difficult time we live in. We hear a lot of bad news about what's going on. Uh, environmentally and with not just pollinators. So I think this is a way that people are happy and willing to become engaged. And on that note, uh, these are some options depending on whether you're tuning in from uh, utility or uh, roadside, ways that you can be involved and, and help out. So you can take the time to plan to reduce the mowing and spraying on rights of way and any lands that are managed. Um, if you're a landowner, this might be your own acre. Perhaps it's currently mown, and uh, maybe you'd like to pull back on that. 
beginning of your mowing to favor pollinators, and I'll point you to a great resource for that in a second. Uh, invest in training on integrated vegetation management for staff and contractors, and contractors are turning out to be a pretty important piece of this, so not to be overlooked. Work with a native seed supplier in your area to develop and cost seed mixes for local conditions. A lot of native seed suppliers are really quite knowledgeable. And if they don't have specific information on your area, they can probably help direct you to someone who can. You can try naturalist groups to help, help you develop an appropriate native seed mix. Communicate, communicate, communicate. It's been said there's no such thing as too much communication. So uh, that's been borne out for us, for sure. And certainly one thing that everyone can do is just observe local rights of way, observe your roadsides and observe the management that's on those roadsides. There's room for change. Your best approach is to contact perhaps elected representatives, staff, encourage changes and share information with them in order to favor pollinators and other wildlife. So um, just to point you to a few resources before we get uh, into questions. Canadian Wildlife Federation has a database and it, there's actually an interactive map now on native plant suppliers. So you can, uh, if you Google that, your best route to it is actually just to Google these specific words. Um, it, it can be hard to find on the website, but it should take you to it. Pollinator Partnership Canada is another organization that we're working with in order to move this forward. And they have some fantastic resources on their website. There's a technical guide directed at Ontario roadsides for enhancing, managing, and restoring pollinator habitat. There's a separate guide for the same on utility land. So those are well worth checking out. And Pollinator Partnership can also help with your species list. There are eco-regional planting guides for most eco-regions in Canada, certainly many southern, most in southern Canada. Um, Monarch Joint Venture has a great fact sheet that's called Mowing and Management Best Practices for Monarch. And it outlines, I believe it's for the continental US. Uh, it outlines timing and management for all these areas that, that will help in terms of when monarchs arrive and when to avoid mowing and so on. So um, you kind of have to work with it a little bit because it's the continental US, but uh, I think for Southern Canada, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and an organization that we've been involved with that has been a great resource for us is called the Rights of Way as Habitat Working Group. They have a fantastic website. Uh, they're based in Chicago, but it's an organization of over 200 right of way managers. So everything from pipelines to utilities. And this is a really a communication and networking group. The website hosts best management practices, case studies. There are recorded webinars that have fantastic technical information. So it's really worth, really worth checking out. And I need to thank our terrific partners, uh, the Trillium Foundation, Stewardship Program of the federal government and also the Species at Risk Stewardship Program uh, by the Ontario government and our terrific partners who've been uh, involved in this at a really uh, dedicated personal level too. So a huge Personal thanks to the NCC, Lanark County and Hydro One staff, as well as the Ottawa Field Naturalist Club, who have helped us along the way. So with that, I, I'm just, what I'll do is I'll backspace it to the resources and if people still are writing those down, we'll leave it on that and James can help us with the questions. Thank you. Great, that's great. Thanks, Holly. <clears throat> Thanks, Holly and Carolyn, for that. Um, I just made sure I muted your microphone so we don't get too much feedback. If anybody is getting that, let me know through the questions and I'll fix that. Um, I think one question that came up uh, is about the use of the slides and presentations and uh, these slides in this presentation. And we will be making, or we're, we're recording this now and we're hoping to make this available on uh, our website they're at the helpthemonarchs.ca or through the webinar website where everyone got the link through to get to this. Um, about the presentation itself, we may also be able to do that. So we'll, we'll see, stay tuned for that and, uh, and we'll, we can let people know. Um, a question that came up uh, that probably is of interest of a few people is, um, 
about the timing of flowering. So do we choose flowering plants that flower different times a year to provide a food source at multiple times? And another question that ties quite in is what's the difference between native versus non-native plants as far as a pollinator food source? Is there, is there a difference? Does it matter? Okay, so yeah, that I haven't got into seed mixes at all, really. Um, but that is exactly the goal of the seed mixes that you'd want to uh, be using. So as somebody said to me once, we don't just eat at Thanksgiving, and neither do pollinators. So we really need to create seed mixes that last for an entire season. So we want some species that flower early in the season, some in the middle, and some towards the end. Typically what you find is that the easiest season to fill is the end of the season. So the easiest season to get seeds for, these are typically the seeds that are easiest to come by and least expensive. The hardest season to include in your seed mix is the early season. So anything from May, June, there you won't be able to get as many seeds that, as many flowers that bloom at that time. One of them actually is common milkweed. Common milkweed is a pretty good early to mid bloomer. So for this reason, we had seed mixes with, um, I was a bit, went a bit crazy with it. We, we had about 40 native species in ours, and that was a mix of native grasses as well as wildflowers. So, right, and uh, shrubs and trees are also early. So you can, you can take some comfort if you're on a roadside or a right of way that uh, shrubs and trees surrounding your pollinator site will support pollinators early in the season. So, and the second part of that question was related native to- Native versus non-native. Right, yeah. When I first started this, I was, I was much more focused on the native flowering plants, but it is certainly the case that non, some non-native flowering plants do offer nectar and pollen resources to pollinators. Some act as hosts for native butterflies uh, native moths, for example. So it's not, I, I, I'm much less uh, rigorous, I guess, about that difference, but certainly many native pollinators are sp more specifically adapted to the native plant. So that's, that's really our target here. Um, and that's, that's what we've focused on. The non-native ones will come in on their own anyway. Uh, and follow up, people who can't hear me very well, but um, is there a preferred timing for planting? Great question. Is there, is there a preferred timing for plantings? And um, there is. Uh, what you read on all the seed packets and the information you get from, from seed growers is that the best time to plant is in the fall. And that's because a lot of native species have hard seed coats and they need that cold season, cold, wet, season to break the seed coats down so that they germinate. So you get better germination. We had one year of funding and we scrambled to get our sites prepared and we didn't have our seed mix in time. It's pretty hard to buy seed mix if you're starting in October <laughs> because that's the point in time when they're just harvesting their year's, um, year's products. So we seeded in the spring and I was really assured by a couple of experts that just do it, just go ahead and do it. And uh, I'm expecting that we'll see some different species come up next spring after they've had that stratification. Time. Answers the question. Great. Um, another question, kind of more so looking at the municipality side of things as well. Um, and this is specifically asking how did Lanark County deal with the um, uh, levels of service reduction? So basically contractors, I guess, less, uh, less mowing, less uh, decrease in contract. And I know that um, you know, some places in the States have been doing this for a lot longer, so they may have more experience than we do on this, but I'm curious on that. Okay, thank you for that question. So that is like a little bit difficult for us to answer because of course we're not the contracting agency in this. What, uh, and we're, we will have Lanark County on uh, as a guest of a future webinar. So that will be one of the details, but 
but I do want to address it at a certain level. So if you're a roadside uh, manager, you have contracts, they're multi-year contracts, it would be really difficult just to shut those contracts down at the end and not continue. And I think that's kind of, you have your way of doing business and I don't think it would be appropriate for us to just shut everything down and switch up entirely. However, if we're talking about a switch from boom spraying, which is very broad swath spraying of herbicide and switching that up to more of the backpack spraying where you can target these very pernicious non-native cool season grasses, follow up with some seeding, and then that becomes continuation of contracts, but you're, you're increasing the functionality of the, of the species for pollination over time. So your first cut is just to reduce your mowing to once a year, even once every other year, um, and then follow up with very targeted approach to remove those cool season invasive grasses that really continue to outcompete those natives. Then you have a continuation of contract. So I hope that's in some way, uh, you know, a bit of a response, but we hope to get more details from Lennar. Great, and maybe kind of a follow-up that's tied into that is what kind of management do these plots take? What kind of um, active management do we have to do throughout the year on these, these test plots and then going forward as well? Our plots, on our plots specifically, uh, working with our partners, we'll make some decisions about whether and how we'll continue to manage them. Certainly on the plot that has wild parsnip on it, we would like to work at controlling that. The seed heads have already been taken off by Lanark staff, so it won't be reseeding. Uh, and we'll remove that at some point, whether that's through spot spraying or whether that's through hand pulling with volunteers, which is certainly possible on small scale sites. Uh, we'll, we'll do that because it's, it's a test plot. I think what we're looking for is over the long term, we're looking for minimizing any of that maintenance requirement. So the idea is really to just let these plots do their thing and to prevent woody weed encroach, woody, woody plant encroachment as necessary, if it's necessary, um, but more or less to just let it go ahead and perhaps every one to three years uh, conduct mowing to knock it back to an earlier successional stage. Certainly, there's no requirement for fertilizer at any stage. Uh, great. Okay. Um, tying in with that as well, uh, there was a um, question about the the seed mixes. So as well as like you know percentage of native flower mixes versus graminoids versus graminoids being grasses and sedges. Um, is there kind of services providing and speak to that about the, what you would use for just one style, like a flowering plant versus grasses and sedges in there? Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Percentages. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, so is there, Sometimes I get asked why why are we putting why are we putting grasses in here at all? <laughs> if what we're after is native flowering plants, what's what's the deal with the native grasses? Um, the standard answer is that they they help bind the soil at an earlier date. Earlier, they're kind of rapidly germinating and and establish faster. That hasn't been our experience um, at our sites. So I'm not quite sure why that is, but that's something that we'll continue to look at. We seeded at a rate of about 60% wildflowers to 40% native grasses. We were working with cool season grasses at our sites, native cool season grasses, as opposed to the warm season grasses, things like big blue stem, little blue stem, the prairie grasses. Those are not really very native to our area. So we, we chose a different mix and they haven't really thrived at our sites and I'm not sure why. In any case, the idea is that the native grasses provide the patchiness of the habitat, the gaps in which the native wildflowers at a seeding rate of about 60% come up through. So 
what you're trying to create is a native ecosystem as opposed to really a garden. And that's the reason that you need the native grasses. They, the clumps provide structure for certain pollinators. Bees nest, for example, in their bases. The hollow stems provide nesting area for uh, breeding area for certain insects. So, so it's all part of the habitat type. Great, and I think maybe we'll finish on, on one last question. Um, tying in, and you did talk a bit about this, Holly, with the, the perspective of people and what, what to set their perception for, or set them up for if, as far as what the look of some of these roadside areas might look like or people's front or backyards that are looking beyond roadsides to also have their, their lawns more native and more uh, less just mowed grass. Um, can you talk a little bit about how we can incorporate that and, and temper or set people's expectations and how people can react to to that? Yeah, it's Carolyn here. So I'll address that. And that that has been identified by some of our partners or future partners as being a real challenge. And it's an aesthetic. Many people um, view a nice cut green mown lawn as a beautiful sight. And a native uh, wildflower habitat, especially when it's first being established, looks really messy. And that runs counter to that aesthetic. So we view now that as actually being a challenge to overcome and shifting citizens in their aesthetic is, is going to take time. And it's going to take, as Holly said, communication, communication, communication. We're preparing to launch a communication strategy, a marketing strategy to help uh, address that. And with anything that requires kind of a behavioral shift, it's going to take a lot of messaging. So it's taken a long time for us to build that aesthetic and it'll take a while to, for us to unbuild the aesthetic, but um, having messages and increasing awareness of why. As Holly mentioned, you need the grasses. It provides homes for the pollinators, a place for them to dig into the ground. Most of the bees are solitary and they need that ground space. Pollinators need their flowers and we need to have diversity. So it's a really embracing diversity is the aesthetic that we're, we're hoping to go to. Great, um, thanks. So is there any last wrap up from you two? And I, I know everybody who's participated in this, we will have uh, more information on the, the web link where you came, went in before you went to register for this. Um, we'll have a couple more webinars coming up in the new year um, before spring, I believe. Um, so stay tuned and are there any last additions for you two? I just want to finish up by thanking you all for participating in this webinar and showing a great deal of interest through your questions. I also want to express a great deal of gratitude for our funders, Environment Climate Change Canada through the Habitat Stewardship Program, the Government of Ontario through the uh, Species at Risk Stewardship Program, and the Ontario Trillium Foundation, uh, without whom we wouldn't be doing this project and learning a lot. Uh, also, our fabulous partners, Hydro One, Lanark County and the National Capital Commission. And I also just want to give a little shout out to Hydro One. We talked about Lanark and all the efforts that they're doing. Hydro One also has many pollinator initiatives throughout the province in Southern Ontario and Eastern Ontario. And they, they're a terrific partner. And we're looking forward to continuing our partnerships. And we think that um, there's a lot of potential to do some really, really great work on rights of ways in, uh, in Canada for pollinators. So thank you all for joining us today.